We're here today with Dr. Terrence Roberts of the Little Rock Nine, nine of the students who successfully integrated public schools in Little Rock, Arkansas in 1957. Dr. Roberts, pleasure to have you here today. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Definitely is an historic moment, and, and I'm honored to say that we welcome you here to the campus of UNC Pembroke. Well, it's my pleasure to be here. Yes, sir. Definitely want to begin by, you know, asking, you being born in 1941, how did your parents, you know, prepare you for success in life during the post-war area? Well, I think in terms of preparation, it was probably um, daily modeling and also instilling within me and my siblings, I'm one of seven, yes, sir. this notion that in order to successfully navigate this terrain called America, we needed to know something. Yes, sir. We needed to be educated. So education was stressed. In fact, one of the things I heard more often than anything else in my life growing up was, boy, get your education. And once they sent me to school, it all made sense because I began to find out what education really was all about. And I loved it. Education, you know, by simple definition, at least for me, is knowing more of the options available in the universe. Tragically, too many people try and get through life exercising only one or two options, and they use them in every situation. And obviously, that just doesn't work. So my parents were prescient enough to know that we needed more options. Yes, sir. You know, it's, it's funny that you mentioned education, you know. How were you educated in terms of the Jim Crow philosophy of Little Rock, Arkansas? Huh. It was like uh, learning by immersion. Yes, sir. When I showed up on the scene, uh, it was obvious. It was all around me. The law, the custom, everything was designed to make sure everybody knew that we were a segregated society. It was not something that anybody sat down and talked to me about, but, you know, just observing daily life, it, it was quite apparent. Now, you know, what a lot of people don't realize is that, you know, uh, Brown versus Board of Education was ruled in 1954. But here it is, 1957, and Little Rock is finally accepting the fact that they have to integrate public schools. How did you feel w with the Little Rock decision? You know, how did that you know, Well, you, you? You, you see that that three-year period was a significant delay? Well, in my mind, <laughs> it wasn't a delay at all. In fact, that was very speedy. Yes, sir. Given the tenor of this country in terms of its history, we are pretty slow about making those kinds of changes. So this was actually moving pretty fast, especially for Little Rock. Now, the Little Rock School Board decided in 1956 to obey the law. There was no precedent for that, absolutely none. But the mixture of people on the board at that time, their sensitivities, their sensibilities, all led them to the conclusion that they needed to take heed of this Brown decision and come up with a plan to desegregate these schools. So they did. They manifested it, of course, as of September 1957, but it was okay with me that it took the three years because I had been ready for it since 1941. That's yes, when I came on the scene. Yes, sir. So how were you and your colleagues selected as far as who would attend uh, Central High School? We all volunteered. Once the school board put the plan together, they came looking at the all-black schools for potential participants. And probably 150 of us volunteered at the time. And of course, as we know, those numbers dwindled down to the eventual nine, but there were more. Yes, sir. And obviously, a lot of parents were not favorable to the notion of their kids doing this thing, so they pulled them out. A number of kids, upon reflection, thought, well, maybe I don't want to put myself out there on the line, so they pulled themselves out until finally we had nine. Yes, sir. You know, I definitely, I definitely understand and appreciate that. And so, okay. September 1957, let's think about that whole summer. You knew you would be attending Central High School in the fall of that year. You know, how did you all prepare you know, for that first day of school? I don't, don't think there was any preparation to speak of, really. During that summer, in fact, I was traveling a bit, uh, traveling throughout the South. I had a friend who lived in Little Rock, and he and I spent a lot of time together, and we went to visit some of his relatives in various places. Mm -hmm. I remember going to a little town called Opelika, Alabama. <laughs> I'd never been there before. Probably never go back, but <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, when I came back from this sort of mini vacation, I learned that the school board had actually tried mm -hmm. to stop the whole thing. They wanted to end this desegregation experiment, but the NAACP had found out about that and filed court papers to get them to stop. It was, it was sort of vicious. But the school board was, by this time, responding to the opposition, the forces in town who didn't want any of this, and they were caving in. So we would have been the Little Rock Zero yes, sir. had it not been for that intervention. Yes, sir. 
you know, can you give us your opinion of the 101st Airborne and how, you know, how they escorted you all? Sure, school year? sure. I mean, you know, eventually it became necessary for the Army to come. And by the way, without them, I think we would have been killed. But these were young men. They were not much older than we were. We were basically 15 and 16 years old. They were 18 and 19. That was one thing I noticed at that time, that here are all these soldiers. None of them are old guys. See, the old guys are sitting back at desk deciding we're going to war, but they're not going to fight. They're going to send young guys. So I tell young men all the time, even today, even though we have no draft, be alert, because if there's a war in our future, you are going to have to fight it. The old guys are not going to go. Oh, yes, sir. But what I found out is that soldiers obey orders. They were ordered to protect us. That's what they did. Absolutely no deviation. Yes, sir. Now, we do know that Brown versus Board of, Board of Education, uh, they struck down the separate but equal clause. So can you describe for us the differences in the facilities of, of Dunbar Junior High and Horace Mann High School in comparison to Central High School? Oh, sure. That's an easy assignment because Little Rock was simply a microcosm of this whole country wherein the facilities for white kids were always much more commodious, much more well-equipped, teachers paid much more money, and same was true in Little Rock that our school at that time for many years it was Dunbar High School which was literally a very smaller physical replica of Central High School and in fact at one point a few years ago I was in the rotunda of the Arkansas State Capitol there in Little Rock and they had a display about education and the history of schools and when it came to Dunbar there was this little sign that said the finest school for Negroes mm -hmm. in all the South and I thought to myself, aha. So that's how they sort of justified it. They figured if they could put out something that was good enough for us, certainly it wouldn't have been good enough for white kids, but for Negroes, it was the best. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now, Mr. Ernest Green, who was a senior at the time you guys integrated the public schools, uh, his graduation from Central High School, how did that compel you to just continue your high school studies? Well, I don't know if it did, really. Um, graduating from high school, for me, was foregone conclusion as it was for all nine of us. That was simply one of the steps toward an eventual advanced degree of some sort. I mean, we'd all heard that same admonition, get educated. Yes, sir. So we were, we were good students. We were good students. And it was simply because we had made that choice early on, and there was never any question about whether we were going to use these educational institutions in support of our own learning. Yes, sir. Now, you know, we often hear about the white attitudes and opinions of integration, but tell us about some of the opinions and attitudes of the black community as far as you all integrating public schools. Well, of course, whenever you talk about a community of people, you have to look at a wide continuum because yes. there's never, ever unanimity of opinion. Yes, sir. You'll have varying degrees. Now, there were some people, black people in Little Rock, who were afraid that this shift, that this desegregation of schools would lead to unemployment, lack of opportunity for financial gain, lack of eligibility for bank loans, etc. And it was all true. A number of black people were immediately fired even though they didn't have kids in the school. A number of them lost job opportunities. And so that fear was real. Now, by contrast, at the other end of the continuum, there were people who were pledged to support us regardless of financial loss. That did not factor in. The goals were too high for them to be concerned about their own personal welfare and well-being. Now, your family, how did, they, how did they feel about you attending Central High School? Well, my parents especially were 100% supportive. And I often talk about the fact that I don't know where they got that attitude because there was nothing about them to suggest that they would have done that. I mean, they were not politically active. They were not out on the front lines of social protest. But I think they realized when I came home and explained that I had volunteered, that here was a window of opportunity that probably would not be open that long. Yes, sir. They saw that, and they were able to say, okay, you go through it, we'll be behind you 100%. Now, Mrs. Daisy Bates, who was the, uh, the advisor and counselor, so right. to speak, of you all, uh, can you describe for us her wisdom and her, you know, her knowledge, and how does she all prepare you all for the first Well, now, school? Daisy Bates and her husband, L.C. Bates, were two people who were out on the front lines of social protest. They owned and distributed a local newspaper, the State Press, yes, sir. the Arkansas State Press. And they realized that as the thing began to grow, that they probably would suffer financially, and they did. Their paper 
had to be eventually stopped because they lost advertising. But even that didn't deter them from being the kind of supporters that we needed to have. Both of them were stalwart in their support of us, and they suffered greatly. I mean, they had crosses burned on their lawn, their home was dynamited, they had bricks thrown through the window, all of that stuff, but none of it forced them off the scene. Yes, sir. Now, one of my favorite philosophical standpoints is that fear can hold you prison and that hope can set you free. You know, is, is that the same admonition of hope and of, of determination? Was that the same, you know, same level of, of commitment that you all faced? Well, probably, probably, although what I learned about fear was very significant. Fear can be devastating. It can be physically, mentally, socially, psychologically disturbing, but it does not have to interfere with your choice to move ahead. So goal-directed behavior can still be your choice, even though fear is there. So I would accept what you said, certainly, and uh, add, especially to those young people who are watching the show, that if you're ever afraid of anything, doesn't matter what it is, don't worry about it. Take that fear, put it in your pocket. It's portable. Yes, sir. It'll go with you. Yes, sir, absolutely. Now, one of the common photographs that we see in terms of uh, the integration of public schools in Arkansas is the picture of Miss Elizabeth Eckford and how she arrived at school that day. Uh, uh, she didn't get the phone call that you all were going to meet. Well, going rumor to has it. <laughs> I don't know if there's any truth in that or not. Uh, this is suggested that she didn't get the phone call. I didn't get a phone call either. Um, and we did have a phone. Elizabeth came alone by herself. I came alone from the other end of the school. And in fact, the two of us were alone with that mob. And when you look closely at the archival photos, you will see that. You'll see Elizabeth on one part, you'll see me on another. It's interesting how American media works. Mm -hmm. They take a story and run with it. So that one has legs. That whole notion about Elizabeth not getting the phone call is now part of the lore. Nothing you can do about it. So we might as well accept it as it is. It's not factual, but it's out there. In any case, uh, there's some truth to it. I mean, it's not completely bogus, but they're just shades. Yes, sir. There's definitely gray in every situation. Absolutely. Yes, sir. So being escorted through the back door, you know, how did you all feel having to go through the back door? Well, I'm not sure what you're referring to here. Uh, there was a time when we had to be escorted into one of the side doors. It wasn't the back door, but that's okay. I mean, to me, if you can gain access, it yes, doesn't matter which entrance you use. <laughs> if it's someplace you want to get to, you could go through a roof chamber if you wanted to. Yes, sir. But if, you, if, if that were your goal, to get in. It was necessary, actually, to take us in that way because the mob was out to get us at the front door. So we avoided the mob. We circumvented the danger, as yes, it were. So we do know that you had the armed escort by the 101st Airborne Division, but at what period of the day were they not allowed to escort you? Oh, no, they escorted us all day. Now, the problem was they couldn't enter certain places. Yes, sir. They could escort us through the hall. Mm -hmm. They could not enter the classrooms, the auditorium, the cafeteria, the gymnasium, the bathrooms, places like that. So those places obviously became prime areas of combat. Yes, sir. Certainly. Certainly. Now, in terms of... Uh, we you know, understand that you have a PhD in, in psychology. Right. You know, so in terms of, of, of knowledge and of learning, you know, what wisdom and what pearls of advice can you offer to the college students of UNC Pembroke today? Well, I think I probably would start by telling them something that my first grade teacher told me. My first grade teacher told me that I had to become the executive in charge of my own learning, that I needed to become the CEO of my own independent learning enterprise. She further said that she would teach us all that she knew, but she said, honestly, I don't know very much. She was one honest teacher. She said, I'll teach you what I know, but I admit I don't know very much. I don't even know what you need to learn. That's why you have to become the executive. She said, I'm here as a support, and I will make sure that I'll do everything within my power to make it easy for you to do what you have to do to learn. Yes, sir. Students, once they take on that executive responsibility, will find themselves soaring. They will get rid of lame excuses. They will no longer find school boring. They will no longer find reading uninteresting because they are so excited about learning. And that's the message I would give. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, I absolutely agree with that. You know, 
And the thing about it is, I, I, something I heard you mention earlier is that, you know, that teachers, you know, using the word teachers is a loose term, or more so master learners, because yes. we never stop learning. Exactly. We never stop yeah, learning. Yeah, I often tell teachers that <laughs> it's the wrong term to use, because that term, teacher, implies that you really know something. But the truth is, none of us know very much. But if we could present ourselves as dedicated learners and model learning behavior in front of students, they would get the picture and begin to emulate that behavior and, and go out and learn. Because that's, that's what happens. You see, if you can excite a kid to learn, you don't have to worry about them because they're not going to stop until they know as much as possible. And at that, that point, you see, learning becomes lifelong. I've talked to some students who tell me, the minute I graduated, I burned those books. And I thought to myself, how odd. <laughs> because graduation is not the end of learning. That's simply one step forward. More learning is in the future, yes, always. Sir. Yes, sir. And, you know, def knowledge is definitely power. Absolutely. You know? And without knowledge, you know, you lack the power and the resources to prepare your own future. Exactly right. You're absolutely right, sir. I definitely agree with that. Well, Dr. Roberts, we thank you for your time. Oh, my it's pleasure. It's been my pleasure speaking with you this afternoon, sir. Thank you for definitely having me. come back to Pembroke and visit us soon. We'll do it. Yes, sir. All righty. Now, this is good.